So welcome uh, everyone uh, to this uh, webinar on science communication to boost uh, diversity in STEM. So I'm Natalie Petrelli. Uh, I'll be the chair for today. Um, I'm a senior scientist at the Zoological Society of London. And um, this first session, which is entitled Communication as a way to become more diverse, will feature um, uh, an introduction by me, but also a uh, two talk by uh, Jenny Chambers from the SDFC and by Karen Devine from the British Ecological Society. And to help with the management of everything and also because she was a she's a co-organizer of this event, we have Ayla Watton, uh, who is um, the Subbox Science Coordinator. Hello, everyone. <laughs> so, um maybe we're just gonna start um by uh with the first talk which will be on uh what does diversity in stem have to do with science communication and public engagement so uh, the talk will be roughly 30 minutes each the event is recorded and will be shared on the zsl youtube channel under the edi playlist um, we're going to take question at the end of each um, presentation and uh, to ask any question to our speakers, please use the Q&A um, little button on window on uh, Zoom. <laughs> um, so um, starting uh, with the first presentation, which is uh, mine to try to introduce you to uh, this event and why we went uh, for a discussion around uh, science communication and uh, diversity in STEM. So hopefully, hopefully you see the presentation well, Isla, does it look good? Yes, very good. So I just thought to, um, to introduce uh, this event, it would be good to explain the why why did we go for um, a symposium on diversity in science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, and science communication and public engagement? What, 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 these, what those things have to do with each other? Um, and so to really explain the logic behind that, I think we, we need to take a, a very big picture and start with why, why is science important? So if we think about science, science help us understand the world we are living in make sense of it. The application of scientific knowledge help us to satisfy ba many basic human needs uh, and improve living standards. And then science has been shown to be able to underpin economic growth, support good decision making, and uh, increase our readiness to face the challenges of the future, for example, by enabling prediction. So all in all, science has permeates through all the dimension of our lives and really help us uh, progress society. Now, at the core of the relationship and at the core of the importance of science uh, for human society is the relationship between uh, people and science. And that relationship goes in, in, in different ways. So first of all, um, because science can drive economic growth, uh, nations with cutting edge uh, science sector are likely to do well, which means that it's very important for those nations and that bet on science to progress uh, their economy, to attract and retain people in science, technology, engineering, and mathematics roles. Now, we have also seen that nations where people understand and trust science, they make better, they generally make, take better decisions for themselves and also do better in crisis. And this is something that we have definitely seen during the COVID pandemic, but it's also something that we see whenever we discuss climate change. Now, how do we get people to value science? Um, well, uh, the, how, how to build this science capital is done through a lot of different things. Has to do with scientific literacy, so learning about science in school, it has to do with participation in science-related activities, um, has to do with knowledge transfer, so a knowledge about how uh, science is, can be used in everyday life, has to do with science media consumption, 
and family science skills, to which extent um, they are scientists or people interested in science in your uh, family. It has also to do, but it has also to do with knowledge and qualification and particularly knowing people in science related role. Also has to do with participation in out of school learning context. And so when you think about a country where uh, like the UK, where uh, there's actually a high public interest in science, there's still a lack of connection, a lack of personal connection for people uh, when it comes to science and understanding science. And there's still uh, people that report they do not know much about how scientists work. Um, and at the same time, trust in science journalism has been shown to be relatively low. So the point is that uh, in a country like the UK, where um, there's a lot of media consumption of scientific um, um, content, there's still a place for scientists to help connect people to science. And indeed, in, in a country like the United Kingdom, and being French and having grown up in France, I can definitely tell you that this country is really high on science communication. The opportunity to connect with science through exhibitions, through programs, through presentations, through festival, and through uh, extracurricular activity uh, offered to uh, students, there's, there's really a lot of opportunity uh, to hear about and connect with science and a lot of opportunity for scientists to engage with the public. The problem is, if we start to think about who the scientists are, so who are those scientists that can, that can really uh, talk to the public about science? Well, if we look at the science, technology, engineering, and mathematics uh, community in the UK, we know that three out of, the, of four people uh, from the UK STEM workforce are actually men, and more than four in five are professors when it comes to academia. When we look at ethnic minority, there's around 18, nearly 19% of academic staff that are from an ethnic minority group, but only 3.5% of black academic staff hold a professorship compared to nearly 12% when it comes to white staff. And all in all, in 2019, it was said that there's less than 20 <coughs> black women uh, um, professor in science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. Looking at disability, it's around 4% of the uh, academic staff, um, so also below uh, representation in general population. And all in, all in all, it has been shown that all underrepresented group tend to leave STEM in greater proportion, and that at all stage of the career pipeline. So why is there a lack of diversity in STEM? There's a lot of different reasons for that. Something to do with cultural stereotypes and lack of self-confidence, which leads to the stereotype threat. Access to role models, access to opportunity, um, opportunities and links, uh, issues related to criteria for admission, cost of education, perceived return, as well as bias and racism throughout career development. So we, we might think that the STEM community is not particularly diverse. But then the next question is, are those minorities that are in the STEM workforce actually visible? Well, that's not do, going well either. For example, it took quite a number of years for to have a, a, a black scientist to do the Christmas lecture. The first time it ever happened was in 2020. We know from various studies uh, that women are less likely to be contacted by the media than men about their work. We also see, know that male scientists can receive up to five times more media contact than female. Um, studies that have been done on visibility around the underrepresented community have particularly focused on gender, which is why my uh, stats are biased, and I'm sorry for that. But I've also shown that recent uh, that um, the media tend to largely reinforce the narrative that scientists are white men. Even in the age of technology, where people can really start their own initiative, uh, you see bias. <laughs> so there was a, an interesting analysis of uh, uh, looking at channels uh, developed on YouTube uh, uh, on STEM related, created STEM related channels. Uh, out of the 391 channels that were 
uh, looked at, only 32 uh, had women presenting. And the proportion of hostile, critical, negative, and sexist, sexist comment was much, much higher uh, for uh, channels where women were hosting. Uh, meanwhile, another study also looked at how um, um, people communicating about science were described, whether they were men or women. And the women who publicly communicated there were, were much more likely to be stereotyped as bossy, emotional, uh, and often by their own gender. So what does this uh, mean in terms of uh, having a, a, a STEM workforce that is not particularly diverse and minorities that are not particularly visible? Well, it uh, has been shown that in the UK, most adults are actually unable to name a single living female scientist. And worse, a recent study shows that not, there's not a single woman's name featured in the national curriculum for science in this country which means that less than 0.05% of kids would draw a scientist as a woman. A, a study that is still starting, starting to get a bit old, but uh, done by the campaign by, um, for science and engineering, looked at what parents would, uh, would uh, uh, promote in terms of job to their uh, children. So basically the response to what type of job would you like your children or your child to pursue? when they finish their education. And that showed clear gender bias with <coughs> parents of daughters much more likely to encourage them to become nurse, fashion designer, or teacher, uh, while uh, parents of sons much more likely to encourage them to be engineer or scientist. And then when we look at how uh, 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 those stereotypes uh, 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 follow through in the general uh, in the general public. This there was this study uh, not so long ago uh, looking at how uh, young girls and boys were perceiving uh, science. And it was shown that by six years of age, girls were less likely to believe that girls are really smart. They were also less likely to engage in activities perceived as being for smart people. And that followed up through. Uh, through sexism in school, where it was shown uh, that uh, over a, a majority of teachers admit to, admit to stereotype girls and boys, with teacher consistently rating 11-year-old girls' mathematical proficiency lower than that of boy, with similar achievement and similar learning behaviors. When it comes to uh, ethnicity, uh, we know that only 6.2% of UK domicile students are actually enrolled on STEM related subjects at UK university. And only 6% of them, sorry, are black, which is uh, less than 5% of black African, uh, and only uh, roughly uh, around 1% of uh, black Caribbean. So you might wonder why does this matter? <clears throat> and um, well, the, the first thing is that there's quite a, a lot of challenges right now that society is facing. And having a lot of people not being, under, being underrepresented uh, to help uh, find solution uh, using science represents a, a pure loss of talent. Uh, and this is because we know that more diverse teams uh, are also more likely to outperform a more homogeneous team, basically. The more diverse your scientific community is, the more perspective are brought to the table, the more likely they are to find a solution. But there's also a relationship between the lack of diversity in science and uh, trust. And uh, that lack of diversity uh, can actually impact the trust that the general public will put in science and scientists, uh, which will also harm uh, uh, the possibility for science to help tackle major challenges because it's great to have a solution, but if no one trusts your solution and no one trusts you, then it's, it's the same as not having no solution altogether. And so here, this, this relationship has to do with trust and how who do we trust? And a number of studies have shown that uh, when a person looks similar to us, we're much more likely to believe that they are trustworthy. Actually, we're also more likely uh, to judge them uh, morally uh, competent and, and uh, morally good and competent than, uh, uh, than if they don't look like us. So if I was to do a very simplistic scheme, uh, a graph of, of uh, how this may work, uh, 
So we talk a lot about how the lack of diversity in science, technology, engineering, and mathematics can affect the performance of the STEM sector. But what we need also to recognize is that that lack of diversity through the lack of trust because of the lack of diversity in who deliver scientific message leads to a lack of understanding and trust in science, which can propagate stereotypes and bias and continue to feed to a lack of diversity uh, in STEM, while the lack of diversity in science itself continue to uh, uh, provide a lack of role model and therefore uh, fail to retain whatever diversity it attracts. So this is roughly the, the logic for putting this event together. And so hopefully this week, what you're gonna hear about is a first science communication initiative that's uh, aimed to make minority in STEM more visible and reach new audiences. You hopefully uh, also will be able to reflect on how to best engage new audiences uh, with science and how to best showcase diversity. And finally, we hope to put together some discussion as to ways to better integrate equality, diversity, and uh, um, inclusion consideration when building people's science capital. So thank you very much. Um, and since I'm chairing this morning as well as giving a presentation, <laughs> um, Ayla, do we have any question at this stage? Exactly. Yep, we've got some questions. Um, just a reminder, if you've got questions for Natalie or anyone to type them in the Q&A box. Um, so we've got one that says, what do you think the reasons are for the lack of trust in science journalism in the UK? Uh, it's a good question. I think um, uh, this has been explored a bit. Um, it has to do with, um, uh, with some story that got blown up. Uh, so basically, the, the fact that some scientific results are presented in a much more definitive way than originally intended uh, by uh, the researchers that promoted uh, those, um, those results. And that, that, that uh, overblown, which is later decried also in the media, has uh, um, led to uh, people being uh, dubious about how scientific outcome are being reported. Basically, uh, the, the, the idea behind this is to think that um, science, uh, journalists might tend to uh, um, oversell uh, scientific results, leading to people to panic or to uh, uh, see much more black and white than uh, originally intended. Do you think that's a UK specific thing or can you see that in other countries? Well, yeah, I would, uh, uh, if it has, I don't know how it has been reported in different countries, but my own experience, yeah, it would be that it's probably in all country. <laughs> Thanks. And uh, we've got another one which says, um, what can parents do to combat STEM gender discrimination in schools or from teachers? What can parents do? Yeah. It's, it's a difficult one. So I have I have a boy and a girl and uh, I spend my life uh, correcting people uh, on cliche about boys and girls uh, at school. <laughs> so <clears throat> so um, I think I think providing them with examples and connecting them with different people. Uh, so the, as we've seen, um, the way to build that science capital and those those uh, references you can go you can do that through different uh, uh pathway uh, but the personal connection uh, or the personal experience do make a lot of uh, difference when you can relate to someone and that you know that is clearly doing something and can talk to you about so you, you need to basically find a way to overcome the the seniority that a teacher brings to that uh, role when they say something uh, so to literally kill that gravitas <laughs> by providing a higher level of gravitas. And, and I think that people that do those jobs or that, that, that have an on-hand experience can really bring uh, the balance uh, the discussion. So getting them to, to meet scientists can make a huge difference, I think. And one that's um, kind of related to that is, you mentioned the role of parents in influencing their children, how do we reach this group of people? How do we talk to the parents? Yeah, I, it's um, it's 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 quite a difficult one um, because uh, parents do have to juggle with so many things um, that um, um, and do tend to trust school to to do the 
the, the education about science, etc. Um, that it's, it becomes it not only a problem of reaching them, but addressing their own um, uh, fixed idea about what science is. So if you, you know, it's quite difficult to engage a parent that might be busy and hate science. <laughs> so um, I think there's, but there's been a lot of initiative to try to, to, um, to find solution by basically trying to appeal, to, to create opportunity for those people to connect with science without them really choosing to do that. And I think the more we can uh, diversify the way we engage people uh, in ways where we, we, we really reach new audiences and connect with people that don't systematically choose to do that anyway, uh, um, either that or um, uh, creating more opportunity with the kids, but actually it's, it's, it's not an easy going. I'm hoping we get much more um, answer to this uh, from our speakers. Great, thanks. Um, and we've got one that says, thinking about the COVID vaccine uptake, could the lack of uptake in certain communities in the UK and abroad be linked to who's communicating the messaging, such as in ethnic minority communities and young people? Yeah, there has been a lot of work on this. Uh, so, well, when we started at the pandemic, it was, uh, it was primarily white male uh, talking about uh, about uh, what the pe what people would do, but we have started to see a diversification of, of, of people brought on board to talk about um, strategies in the health, uh, uh, strategies to to get out of the pandemic. I think that some countries have done better than others uh, and have realized this much more than others. I think the UK could probably do even more. Uh, it would be nice also to be consistent as to, to have thought about diversity from the start because a retrofitting sometimes uh, doesn't doesn't pay that much off. But uh, yeah, we've definitely see a link between diversity of, of the communicator and um, trust in, uh, in the message. And um, there's just one comment here which says, um, it is true that there's a male bias in the UK national curriculum, but there has been slash is mention of Rosalind Franklin, Madame Curie and others. Uh, have you got a comment towards that? So uh, it, it, there's always been a mention of Marie Curie, <laughs> but um, and I think that's uh, whenever you ask anyone about a, fem a women scientist, that's probably the first name that uh, most people come with. But this was uh, uh, the outcome of a recent analysis of the curriculum, so really looking at uh, the the paperwork to try to see whether they could fit, and and they didn't. It was actually covered in the Guardian and the BBC, so the report should be easily accessible to whoever wants to look at it. And there's uh, just one more, which says, you mentioned stereotypes and stereotype threat. Um, how are these two things different? A stereotype is when uh, someone thinks something out of you. Uh, so they think, for example, um, you're a girl, therefore you're less likely to be good as a scientist. So uh, the stereotype threat is when you start to believe it. So that you think, well, I'm a girl, and I'm, I'm, I'm not going to be good at doing at doing science. So. Uh, it's it's uh, someone can believe that you are something without you believing it. The stereotypes threat is when you start to accept that this is true and therefore limit yourself. Um, yeah. Great, thanks. That's all the questions we've had in the Q and A so far. Oh no, there's one just come in, um, which says, in terms of the curriculum, are there female ethnic minority disabled scientists in particular that you feel should be included? Oh yeah, I, th I mean, I said um, a lot of my presentation is based on the uh, analysis uh, that are focused on gender because I really struggle to look for other dimension of diversity and uh, studies that um, that mimic that level of depth in analysis. But I really do think that uh, representation matters. So the more diverse the, the the people that are featured in the curriculum, the more you're likely to provide a role model to to a child. And is there anyone in particular? that you would put as your top person? No, <laughs> yes, I, could, uh, I mean, I, I do think that, um, uh, so I think there's a balance to be struck be between always featuring all dead people as role models and using people that are alive. So I would like to see more balance in terms of diversity of, of, um, of um, background, but also providing people that are alive as well as people that are dead. So I actually think it, it, it would take quite some work to build a, a, you know, a nice portfolio of diversity through all those dimensions. Good. Great, thank you. That's all the so questions. We are ready we for had. our next. Yeah. Thank you very much.
Okay, so our next uh, speaker um, is uh, Jenny uh, Chambers from uh, the SDFC. So Jenny has worked in public engagement um, um, for and funding for 13 years. Uh, she joined the SDFC in August 2019 and was delighted to take over leadership of the Wonder Initiative, which prioritizes engagement and co-production with young people from challenging socioeconomic in our public engagement grant program and direct engagement delivery. So Jenny will talk about uh, focusing on audience demographic to help with diversity in STEM. Um, Jenny, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Natalie. Good morning, everyone. It's delightful to be here. Uh, didn't quite get the trip down to London we might have hoped for, but the world is conspiring against such things at the moment. But it is delightful to be able to, uh, to meet together in this virtual format. Uh, please forgive any technological gremlins I have. I've had 18 months to nail them, but still they keep percolating their way through. Uh, so what I'm going to talk about today is a little bit about who STFC are, how we approach public engagement, and as Natalie said, really focusing on how we're working to diversify our audiences through what we've called our Wonder Initiative. Uh, so STFC, the Science and Technology Facilities Council, you can see why we go for abbreviations, um, until about three years ago was an independent research council, but with the um, advent of UK Research and Innovation, also known as UKRI, all the research councils came together under that one single UKRI umbrella. Like several councils, STFC retained a public engagement team and function because it's really important to us, but it's delightful that we're now able to work in partnership with a large UKRI central public engagement team and across councils with um, public engagement colleagues so that our public engagement has its unique brand identity, if you like, that is bespoke to STFC science, its facilities and its researcher and public communities, but that dovetails really closely with the other objectives of the research councils and the overarching aims and directives of UKRI. Uh, one of the things that people might have heard about, um, our new chief executive, Ottoline, is very, very keen on looking at the inequalities within the research system and really trying to front foot work around equality, diversion and inclusion to help fix some of the problems in the system that Natalie pointed out. I'm sure Karen uh, and also myself will reflect on and I said also that we'll be hearing about uh, throughout the remainder of this week. So uh, UK, UKRI uh, provides that sort of that overarching framework and we're releasing a public engagement strategy we think towards the ends of this year. But um, SCFC, as I say, has a long history of public engagement and places a high corporate value on that. Our programme is long standing, it's large, it's varied. We work in collaboration. We recognise no matter how effective our teams and our scientists are, we can't single handedly reach everything and everyone that we want to. So we look for strategic partners, both in science communication and engagement delivery, but also within communities and other funding agencies. Uh, all of our work is underpinned by a strategic direction. We place real priority on evaluating our program, understanding what's working, and more, even more importantly, trying to get a feel for what's not so that we can all adapt our behaviours. And as I say, partnership working underpins all of that. In practical terms, um, once upon a time, there was a head office, office in Swindon and many of us worked from there. That's where myself and my team are, are notionally based, although like a lot of other people, we're camped out in various different corners of our living rooms, dining rooms and bedrooms at the moment. And that the team from the Swindon office, um, we work primarily on grants programs, strategic partnerships, but we also do a little bit of local public engagement uh, within our, our, our local catchment areas. That's complemented by public engagement teams, at our main lab and facility sites, uh, Royal Observatory up in Edinburgh, RAL, Darsbury and Baldy facilities. They all have public engagement teams. We all um, operate the same strategy, but it's those lab based teams that do the do a huge amount of actual direct public engagement delivery. So we have this real mix of kind of grants programs and extensive delivery ourselves. We're also very much more conscious than a lot of funders might be about what's termed the kind of the pipeline issue. Obviously having all of these facilities, we have a huge need to have skilled workforce coming through um, that pipeline um, 
which I know is, is an analogy that's a little bit problematic, but I'm struggling to think of a better one. So bear with me with pipeline around this. So obviously as we need huge numbers of technicians um, and researchers, we're very, very conscious that the, the flow of young people from diverse backgrounds for all the reasons that Natalie pointed out is really important to making sure that our workforce reflects our society, that people can see themselves within our workforce, be that on the technical side or the researcher side, or even the even less glamorous side, like the more administration side, like myself and team members, that people, that there are a variety of roles and that there are huge amounts of opportunities for everyone. And we want to try and showcase that as much as we can using as varied a set of role models as possible to try and resonate with as, as many um, of the demographics out there in our complex society as possible. Is that slide moving? It is, it's just moving on slowly. So as I've said, STFC... Um, Jenny, Jenny, I don't think your slide's coming up. Ah, okay. we can, we can just on see... my screen. And we can just see um, the, the background picture where it's not uh, maximised yet. Hmm. I can't see what you're looking. So you've just got a reduced slide image. Um, we've got um, the thing before you start the slideshow where it's got all the slides down the side. That's really bizarre. Hang on, let's see what we can. I see. You see, I did. At least I got my excuses in early with the technological gremlins. What are you seeing now? We've still got the same. That's really weird. That's not what my screen is showing at all. Um, there we go. Slide four of 14. Okay, and maybe it's just being really, really slow. Um, I'm, I'm scared of it now, so I'm not going to try and go back to the other slide. Um, basically, what that was describing is the fact that our public engagement program reaches across the UK. Um, we reach well in excess of a million people per year. We're striving to create communities of good practice, raising our own standards, sharing learning to hopefully uh, improve practice across the board. Um, because we have these facilities and resources, it's also really important that we open our doors and let people come in and see both who scientists are and what they look like and what they're doing. Uh, but all of this work is underpinned by the slide that you can now actually see, which is our, our public engagement strategy, which has a variety, uh, which has sort of five aims, all of which striving towards the mission of a society that values and participates in scientific endeavor. And those aims are around showcasing our science and technology, building the right partnerships, developing and supporting STEM influences both within our direct community and outside of it, improving our reach with diverse audiences and making sure that the engagement we deliver um, is both high quality in and of itself and delivers high quality outcomes. Now, what will happen when I try and move the slides on? Yay! Um, so as I say, our reach for the public engagement programme is, you know, um, is quite impressive. It would have been quite easy for us as an organisation to just be quite content with that. We're reaching a lot of people across the country. We could, you know, that, that's not terrible. However, when we did a little bit of analysis, and forgive me if I end up talking a little bit in the third person around this, and this was work that uh, predated my joining the team, and I'm always a little bit dubious about taking, sounding like I'm taking the claim for someone else's thinking and research. Uh, so if my tenses all go a bit weird or my pronouns expand, there's a, there's a vague reason for that. Um, so analysis was undertaken and we realized that while our audience reach figures are impressive, a lot of those people were already engaged with science, people we'd, we'd now consider to have high science capital. Um, we wanted to challenge ourselves and reach further with, into different audiences, again, for the reasons that Natalie's outlined, that there are huge inequalities across the piece. Um, within our own remit, there are you know, there are huge diversity of career potential that we'd like to make sure that young people were aware of. We're very, very conscious that young people often switch themselves off from science. Uh, some of the slides early on shown that, that from a very early age, girls will be less inclined to self-identify as smart, increasingly not think science is for them. Um, so we had, there's a huge amount of consideration about how to approach uh, broadening our audience reach and demographics, what would our focal area want to be? So after a lot of research and consideration, we uh, SDFC decided that we wanted to focus on the 40 
percent most socioeconomically deprived postcodes of the UK. And within that demographic, again, focusing on young people between the ages of eight and 14, hoping to influence their sort of science exam choices. Um, that were being made, and also recognising it's very important to work with families and carers, again, for some of the questions that were picked up um, following Natalie's presentation, how can parents be empowered to challenge teachers if their uh, teachers are uh, enacting stereotypes that we'd really, really rather prefer that they didn't, and to just give the entire in increase the science capital concept uh, for the family so that people are better able to make informed choices as to whether or not science is for them. As I've said before, we recognise that despite our reach, we are unlikely to achieve our aims working in isolation. So we're very keen to establish new initiatives with public engagement organisations, community partners that work across the UK, recognising that it's not just a case of opening your doors or promoting events to this particular wonder demographic. We also need, as was picked up in the questions around vaccinations, we need to be working with people, people communities trust so that it's not just science coming from someone so far outside of their community that you're inadvertently reinforcing that science is not for me message. So we're really looking to work in partnership. Also, um, as a funder, we're keen to share and adopt good practice, making sure that the learning that ourselves, our, our, our public engagement delivery teams, but also our grant holder communities, uh, all that get learning um, gets uh, captured and disseminated. Will the slide move on? Drum roll, please. So in order to do this, we actually made the selection not to put, um, we didn't develop a ring fence pot for our wonder initiative. We didn't have a dedicated single funding call. What we decided to do was to integrate it across all of our public engagement audiences. So there would be a, uh, or, or public engagement work, pardon me. So, so there would be a focus on wonder audiences in the facilities-based public engagement delivery. We would prioritize wonder audience focused engagement in all of our grant calls. Working with the National Coordinating Centre for Public Engagement, we held a series of Wonder Match events, which were uh, small informal uh, workshop events bringing communities and researchers together to try and identify areas of common interest. They could then apply for a really small amount of, of funding, up to £1,000, to continue those conversations with an idea of potentially putting in a funding application down the line. As I've mentioned, we're working in strategic partnership with other organisations. From the offset, we embedded external evaluation and um, we'll be working hard to uh, continue capturing, but increasingly disseminate the learning that we've had through this programme. So having mentioned funding, just want to quickly flag our funding opportunities for public engagement. We have five grant calls that offer tiered levels of funding. Um, the most open of those calls is the Spark Awards. Um, which are open to effectively any organisation that returns accounts that can demonstrate a link to SDFC science or using our facilities. Um, I won't dwell on this because sort of time will be marching on, but yeah, I'm contractually obliged to anyone out there um, who might be looking for public engagement uh, funding to bear SDFC funding in mind. So across all of those calls, we've been prioritising in the panel assessments audiences that uh, pro pro sorry, projects that we're working with wonder audiences and in recent calls we've seen an excess of 80 percent of applicants in some way shape or form looking to work with those wonder audiences as you can hopefully see from this slide our grants program has an excess of 1300 events a year um, reaches many many thousands of people works with a huge number of schools so the value of integrating a wonder demographic within that programme is potentially huge. So just taking a couple of examples uh, from the work that we've been doing. Uh, this is uh, one of our Spark grant holders um, that we're working with uh, Leicester based community organisations. Uh, this was a project that was funded before the pandemic, but has obviously had to adapt hugely in terms of the ways in which they were able to interact with communities, as social distancing uh, and other restrictions meant that the original kind of workshop plans were not uh, going to go ahead in quite the way that we'd hoped. Uh, so this project originated at one of those Wonder Match conversations. 
uh, was led by Helen Mason from the University of Cambridge and Jennifer Carter from the University of Leicester, working really, really closely with the Somalian Community Parent Parents Association and other local charities. Uh, this was a very local program. It was working with families from a single estate. Um, the project began with, uh, with, with a world that was more normal and was able to undertake a visit to the National Space Centre um, and set up a Saturday Science Club for students. Once the, the pandemic kicked in and the team realized that activities weren't able to progress in the same way, they were really, really reflective on the best way to, um, to continue that engagement and found ways to work with uh, local, session, local families online, ensuring that families had access to equipment that would allow them to, to access that online material. I think there's been a lot of pivoting to online engagement work since the pandemic began. And we need to be really, really mindful that while this can bring benefits of improving our reach in that it doesn't really matter where a person is based and where the event is taking place, because if you have internet access, you can join and participate. We need to remember that not everyone does have that internet access and that digital poverty um, is a real problem and we need to be mindful of not inadvertently excluding audiences as we've had to make those changes and adaptations to our program. Uh, a bit of a tangent there, this uh, particular program uh, went on to have family sessions over weekends for primary school children led by older students who presented their work and has led to recognition um, from the Mayor of Leicester in terms of the quality of the engagement and the impacts it's made on individual students' um, perspectives, experiences, confidence, and their valuing of science. Secondly, from one of the, the uh, facility sites, the, the Royal Observatory up in Edinburgh, uh, again, their program had been profoundly impacted by uh, the pandemic and social distancing. Lots of materials went online, um, and there are many, many examples I could have drawn from, from all of our lab teams doing fantastic things with local communities and schools. Uh, but the example I've chosen, again, is quite hyper-local, uh, where our colleagues in Edinburgh worked with the local council um, to understand the needs of communities currently using and accessing food banks. It was recognised, as I say, that digital poverty can be a real concern for people, that it's um, really challenging to manage homeschooling if you're on a sort of single device, limited broadband capabilities, all of that plethora uh, of problems. So the team at Edinburgh were working with the local council um, and food bank charities, and what they did was incorporate activities within those food bank boxes. So there were sort of instruction sheets, um, any materials that would be needed, um, so everything that um, would, would hopefully be commonly available, but it's very easy to make assumptions about what families, particularly those um, in challenging socioeconomic circumstances, what will readily be available to them. So the team were very, very mindful to make sure that anything that was needed for the activity was included within these packs. They ran during half term um, and, and, and over the summer holidays, um, supported by Facebook Live interactions, and reached between 75 and 125 families per week with really, really impressive feedback about both the value of the science, but also that feeling of inclusion that people weren't just being forgotten about um, and having to live very much sort of hand to mouth without any um, supplementary or complementary materials coming in to make life a little bit richer and better. And these families working together around simple science experiments have hopefully both demonstrated that science really can be for any everyone, but also help to involve families as well as young people in those activities. I'm probably not quite as far through as I should be on time, but Natalie hasn't yet shouted at me. So I, I guess I'm doing okay for a moment to talk about a couple of our partnerships. So as I've said, our program has impressive reach and we have really, really um, experienced and dedicated public engagement delivery teams. Our grant holder communities are fantastic, but that still will not give us access into all the communities that we want. Again, picking up the, po on the points that were raised earlier about working with organisations that communities trust. We're delighted to have partner partnered with the Reading Agency uh, on a project called Reading Sparks, which also receives substantial funding from Arts Council England, which is looking at harnessing the, the proven power of reading to engage families with STEM. Uh, in a way that they, they would not necessarily have done so before. So we're piloting it in um, 11 library services 
in socioeconomically challenged communities, also areas that have low arts participation. And both library staff and importantly for us young people will be trained and supported to use science content that's been developed uh, by experts so that they don't have to have that expert science knowledge themselves. They'll be trained in communication and engagement uh, to create and, and deliver activities in libraries that are aimed at younger children and their families. Um, young people will be supported to do this. It's not a case of, right, we've got uh, a group of, of young people caged in a library. We're going to make you talk to them without any support or experience. Um, so young people will be empowered. They'll like, gain greater science knowledge, but also irrespective in many ways of whether or not they then want to go off and be scientists. They will have had that communications and engagement training, which really is one of those sort of those cross cutting transferable skills that will hopefully give them greater confidence in all aspects of their life. I'm going to pause for a moment for a little drink. It's one of the one of the downsides of the online presentation. There's no kind of natural ebb and flow of the audience where you can take a moment to breathe. Um, <coughs> Also apologize for coughing over a microphone. That's also one of the really disgusting things. Do apologize for that. Um, so the Reading Sparks project, uh, again, like a lot of other things has been impacted by the pandemic. We've reframed that project um, depending on when libraries have and haven't been open, but us are hoping to see a real sort of explosion of activity in that program this uh, over the summer holidays. Another key partnership for us is with the Association of Science and Discovery Centers on the fourth iteration of an Explore Your Universe program, um, which focuses very much on partnerships and co-production and working with uh, local communities around um, science centers across the country to understand what their barriers are to science engagement and participation, working with them to develop programs and, and interactions and workshops that actually specifically meet their needs, whilst also drawing on STFC science. So one of the main things where Explore Your Universe differs from a lot of sort of grant funded or partnership projects, we have absolutely no metrics for reach. It's very much around the quality of the, the co-production partnerships and the relationships between the science centers and their communities, rather than concentrating on, well, you only got 40 people to that workshop and previous iterations have had 400, because drawing on that co-production with communities and societies, um, hopefully, while our audiences might be smaller, they're having much more impact on participants and participants and their science centers feel ownership of that. And we're hoping that the, the resonance and ripples of those interactions will uh, will continue and be much more sub, uh, substantive than perhaps a large workshop uh, would be where you don't have that that ownership of the agenda and the activities in quite the same way. Uh, like everything else, this uh, Explore Your Universe uh, project has been um, impacted by the pandemic. Some activities have pivoted online, but because of the nature of the communities that the project's working with, uh, the fact that science centres have been closed for a protracted period during the pandemic, we've actually decided to give the project an extra year to try and pick up these community partnerships as we hopefully emerge from the pandemic so that um, when we get their evaluation work back in, it's able to be a story that's not just about COVID. I mean, COVID is obviously going to be a, a, a huge, uh, theme running through engagement narratives for a long time to come, but we are hoping that a little bit of extra time, there's at least the chance to begin to re-establish those work with community groups, many of which who have not been able to engage with uh, the project as envisaged, as it's been real sort of fight for survival, keeping your head above water, and no matter how strongly we advocate and, valid and, um, and push forward science engagement, it's, it's not going to be everyone's top priority, um, no matter how much we might wish it to be. So giving these partnerships a little bit more time uh, to reinvigorate and to continue to send a signal to the Science Centre network that funders value these relationships and will be looking to continue them uh, in the future. So this is the, 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 the last slide and hopefully you're able to, 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 to see it. Um, so sort of framed it as reflections and next steps. So our Wonder Initiative focused on the 40% the uh, 
of UK postcodes that are facing the, the greatest socioeconomic challenge or the most deprived postcodes in the UK, if you like. Um, we, there was much discussion and debate and research undertaken around what sort of demographic focus we wanted as we were seeking to improve our audience reach. Um, the value of indices of multiple deprivation is that it's a national measure. And as our program is national, it, it puts us on a level, a more or less level playing field for identifying appropriate audiences across the piece. Um, the sad reality of um, of being of, of, of socioeconomic deprivation is that there are a lot of intersecting issues and challenges. And within these impoverished postcodes, there are a lot um, of black and, and ethnic minority communities. So we're re by that focus, by extension, we're reaching out to those communities as well. Um, and an another unfortunate reality, and I think it's been um, compounded by the pandemic is unfortunately, there are pockets of poverty across the country. It's very easy to think of, um, of uh, so, you know, deprived city centres and sort of, you know, rundown areas like that. But an unfortunate reality is large swathes of our communities and societies are suffering the, the impacts of, of financial hardship. So um, brutally put, there is no shortage of audience to work with in these demographics, um, wherever our grant holders might be or wherever our, our facility sites and teams are working. It's also in many ways, um, a, a proxy for science capital, although obviously sort of not, not uh, clear cut um, and with sort of 100% overlap of that. But in a lot of these communities, people are working hard to survive and don't have a history or background of science connections, science capital, very much a, a, a view that science is very much not, not for these audiences. Um, so, uh, so this focus on, on, on IMD gave us wide reach into new audiences for us, a focal way to prioritise that, whilst also not excluding issues of racial inequality, gender and gender inequality, and the inequalities that, um, unfortunately, uh, friends and colleagues with other protected characteristics also experience as they try and, and navigate life. Um, as I touched on earlier, we elected for a cross-cutting initiative rather than a ring-fenced funding core with the aim and ambition that this focus on wonder audiences would really permeate all aspects of our work. Um, we are definitely seeing that. Um, I would have loved to have shared evaluation data, but unfortunately, uh, our, uh, our interim evaluation report is running a little bit behind schedule because of the everything that's been going on over, over the last 18 months. Um, but uh, there are email addresses there. Once we have that, we're delighted to share with anyone who, who'd like to get in contact. And perhaps there's a way of disseminating uh, back through the ZSL communication channels too. Um, we've learned a lot about how to reach and work with wonder audiences in order for these communities to feel properly engaged and valued. It isn't really enough just to promote the fact that you've got an event going on and that, <coughs> excuse me, and that that wonder communities were welcomed. You really need to have those conversations, build trust, um, and all of this relationship building takes time. You're, in order to try and um, make those connections effective, as I've said, partnership working is really, really important to us, either through the examples we've given or through working with organizations such as uniform groups to reach uh, wide numbers of, of young people. It can be quite challenging to work out the extent to which we are reaching those audiences. The downside of framing things around an IMD is that in order to work out which indices of multiple deprivation your audience is coming from, you need a postcode from them. Um, and people are not always willing to share that information. If you're dealing with, with very young people, they may not always know or have been told not to share that information. Um, the pivot online has in some ways made data collection easier and in some ways made data collection more challenging in a way that I'm sure is, is familiar uh, to many of you. Um, so what we've tried to do is be quite generous with our interpretation of, um, 
a proxy data. So if people are working with schools, we're happy to accept the postcode of the schools, recognizing there are limitations and challenging to any of these proxy data, but it at least begins to give us a feel for how and where we're reaching. Uh, We've been working with uh, Cloud Chamber as external evaluators for the program from the offset, and they've developed a short toolkit that focuses on key outcomes um, that provides a very short sort of five or six uh, question list that we're looking for all our grant holders and lab teams to use so that we are building those data um, around the outcomes and impacts that wonder audiences are getting and how we can compare and contrast that to our overarching audience demographic. Are there things that are working particularly well or particularly poorly in what we're doing with these wonder demographics that will help inform what we do next? Um, as I've said throughout, the pandemic has obviously profoundly impacted public engagement and the wonder initiative is no exception. Uh, we've worked really, really closely with our grant holders to encourage them to be really thoughtful about how and if they reconceptualize their programs. Uh, certainly early in the pandemic, there was almost a flood of kind of online content and videos um, coming at, at families, young people and teachers. And we were encouraging our grant holders just to just to, to pause for a little while to consider the aspects of digital poverty that I mentioned before, how they can continue to make sure that they're, they're having meaningful interactions as engagement pivots online. Um, as I said, as weird as it is to talk about, there are there have actually been positives for engagement through the pandemic. Online activity has made it much less important where an event is taking place. And if, and I do recognize this a big if, we can get over that hurdle of digital poverty and access, then there is the potential for events that would have been very hard for uh, either geographically diverse or socioeconomically diverse audiences to reach. There is now that 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 opportunity uh, for online engagement to reach further, and I think that that can work as long as you're thoughtful about it and are providing additional support uh, wherever that's possible. We're hoping for recovery in terms of our own public engagement delivery. We're going to be looking at a, a hybrid program, probably for at least the next couple of years. So online engagement will continue to be a comp component of our port portfolio of direct delivery in a way that it really wasn't prior to the pandemic. Uh, our grant holders are increasingly able to, to go back out in the world and engage with communities um, in the ways that they'd originally envisaged. For the initiative, as I say, we're waiting on our interim evaluation that we should have within a few weeks. The Wonder Initiative was a long-term commitment from STFC to broadening our reach and working with different and diverse audiences. We've been working in this way on paper for around three and a half years. In practical terms, it's probably more like sort of two and a half. Um, so I think we still have a lot to learn. We want to reflect, um, as I've said, on what's worked well, what's been challenging, how we can continue to work in that rich partnership way. Um, but also to, to take, um, to reflect on whether or not the, the wonderful focus around IMD is the correct focus moving forward. There's obviously been sort of huge developments in science capital. Um, there are unfortunately waves and waves of inequality um, and unfairness of access to the excitement um, and career opportunities that, that STFC science can offer and the ways in which we make sure that we're reaching out effectively to as many and as wide an audience as possible will continue to be a priority for us going forward. Um, we will reflect on the good, the bad, and any little bits of ugly there might have been within our, our wonder portfolio, um, whether or not we slightly reconfigure our emphasis working with these audiences will continue to be a priority as we move forward we're refreshing our public engagement strategy in the next 18 months and are expecting um underserved for the want of a better phrase audiences and our prioritization of them their communities and their support needs to be a real priority within that refresh strategy going forward um Lots, lots more I could say, but uh, I believe that, that Karen might quite like her fair slice of time. So I will wrap it up there. Very happy to answer uh, any questions uh, now, or as I said, email um, addresses for both the team and myself are on screen and very happy to pick up conversations offline too. Thank you very much.
Thank you so much, Jenny. So um, we are going to put together a blog um, where we're going to reflect on those four days. And uh, this is the perfect place where we can put something about how to reach out to you uh, about evaluation and anyone who wants to know more about your program. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Most welcome. I, I believe we have a lot of questions. So I pass the floor to Ayla. Thanks. Yes, we do have a lot to go through. Um, Although maybe I can start with one of my own because I was a bit curious to learn more about um, your evaluation process and do you keep in contact with your participants after the event or is it mainly questionnaires on the day? So it very much varies. We have quite a, a diverse portfolio and depending on the, the type of activity, what we try and do is make our evaluation proportionate to that activity. In an ideal world, you would love a detailed, uh, so, you know, before survey and after survey, and then um, follow up uh, interactions uh, at an interval uh, down the line, depending on, you know, again, that interval, depending on, on the nature of the, the engagement um, itself. So yeah, it really, really does vary. The toolkit I mentioned is in order to try and have almost like a baseline scaffold, if you like, to ensure that these sort of these, these five or six questions are addressed um, that talk about uh, ensuring that, that we have got that, that wonder demographic data, um, the age of the young people involved, um, whether or not they think they've learned some, something. So what we've tried to do is kind of recognizing that a lot of the interventions that take place, you may only have that one opportunity to, to talk with participants or participants' family. So that toolkit is trying to focus on getting as much information in as short a series of questions as possible. Um, in terms of wider uh, projects and programs about eva evaluation, again, yeah, it's a little bit sort of horses for courses. A lot of our grant holder work is around multiple interventions, and that obviously lends itself to uh, richer and longer term evaluation processes and approaches. Um, people are also doing a lot with particularly sort of online engagement and the, the built in analytics around that, which certainly give you a lot of the opportunity to capture the, the reach demographics really, really well. We're also looking at how long people actually stay in an online event. So how long do you have to participate in a session for us to view it as kind of as meaningfully engaged? Because you know, there's a lot of of metrics around you know x number x thousand of people have have accessed this resource but we're trying to look at how long people are staying and from that infer whether or not they're actually engaged with the content or they've you know clicked on a link almost by mistake type of thing and quickly realize this wasn't what they're looking for and scurry away again um so we have a variety of of techniques um we also have um, resources to, to help frame evaluation. There's an SDFC public engagement evaluation framework, which again might be a resource to, 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 um, to highlight in the blog. She says, staking a claim for large content areas within the, the, the ZSL blog. Um, but yeah, I think the, the important thing is proportionality. We would love that rich data. Um, and across the Wonder program, where able to aggregate that to a certain extent, there is always the perennial problem of longer term evaluation, going back and revisiting, uh, both in terms of funding that, but also access and permissions. So yeah, the, the, I think that, the, as I keep saying, proportionality is probably the key thing for us with evaluation. Great, thank you. Um, and there's one here on the chat which says, what is the ethnic diversity of the 40 most socioeconomically deprived postcodes? Do they tend to be the majority of one race or ethnicity? I'm going to see sound a bit like all I have is a laminated flashcard of it varies. Uh, but again, I mean, obviously, as I'm, I'm sure you can imagine, across the country, there is a real um, mix of, uh, of ethnicities in those, those postcodes. It's somewhat dependent by the sort of the, the dominant regional um, demographic makeup, um, but certainly uh, a lot of the, the grant funded work that we've done is um, where they where where grant holders are identifying the 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 most socioeconomically deprived communities in the areas they're wishing to work. In a lot of instances, they are from from black and, and, and other ethnic communities. Uh, we're also mindful that um, that there are real issues around uh, deprivation for for, for yeah, socioeconomically deprived white people as well. 
Um, so it's again, it's that balance, depending on where researchers are looking to work, the communities they're engaging, the ethnic minority, the, the ethnic balance of those communities varies hugely. What we encourage everyone to do is be really reflective about the audiences that they're proposing to work with, to try and identify either community gatekeepers or um, community organisations that are trusted by the communities that you want to work with that you can build a relationship with so that you have you are able to work with those communities with a greater um a greater resonance um of, of authenticity rather than just parachuting in jazz hands for science and parachuting out looking to to maintain those relationships over a longer period of time or if not then at least have a, a very well thought out exit strategy okay thank you and there's another one here that says, although postcodes can be used to engage deprived communities and ethnic minorities, how are you identifying and engaging with people with disabilities? That's a, a really interesting question. It's, it's one of the things that we've become aware of through the lifetime of the Wonder Initiative is that when you when you spotlight a demographic, you can accidentally throw shade to extend my metaphor um, onto other communities that are, are dealing with exclusion and challenge issues. Um, we have a long history of working with um, researchers, particularly for the um, visually impaired community. We have uh, resources for the Tactile Universe, um, working with, uh, with Nick Bond and his team to develop sort of 3D models. But it's, yeah, it's an area that, um, that we're probably not doing enough in. And as I say, it's, it's the, it's the unintended consequences of spotlighting a single demographic that with finite resources, there is a, a, a small certain inevitability that where things are being directed in one direction, they're sadly being slightly misdirected away from others. Thank you. Um, and there's one which says, should the UK school curriculum be updated to encourage students to attend virtual STEM events or engagement opportunities? It's a bit of a double edged sword. On one hand, the really tempting answer is yes, these resources should be made available for everyone. Um, there should be curriculum enrichment, there should be enhancement going on within lessons. Um, I think the reality of that is where things are extracurricular, there can be real challenges in equity of access, whether or not that's to physical events or online uh, events. There are massive issues of digital poverty. And I think while it would be really, on one hand, it feels quite simple to go, yes, these things should exist and everything will uh, will improve as a result of them being in existence. I think unless they're carefully managed and access and equity of access is achieved, there's a real risk that they actually compound a problem rather than solving one. Thank Sorry, you. that's rather negative. <laughs> We've got um, a last question, which actually feeds into that, which is what can be done to combat digital poverty? It, I think a lot of it comes down to resources and resourcing. Um, in certain instances, we've, we've been able to support um, purchasing of tech equipment for working with communities who would otherwise have been completely shut out. Unfortunately, I think no matter what organisation you are, your pockets are not going to be deep enough to do that on a hugely broad brush level. At that point, I think it comes back to being really, really careful about what you're planning for your engagement and your outreach making sure that the communities you're, you're looking to work with are able to access the things that you're doing, whether or not that's in-person events or online um, access. I think it's it's all too easy to think, you know, if I put it on the internet, people will come and it will be fine. Um, and I think the reality for a lot of people is that is hugely challenging. Um, you know, families are either trying to manage purely with phone screens or with a tablet that potentially a parent has to work from, kids have to homeschool from. Um, online opens doors, but it's not a universal panacea. Um, building equipment costs to your project if you're applying for funding where you're able to. But the one thing we all can do is be really, really mindful in our planning. Thanks, Jenny. That's it for questions from the chat. Thank you so much, Aina, and thank you very much, Jenny. So we're going to move to our last speaker, um, Karen Devin from the British Ecological Society. Uh, so Karen herself is from a low income background and benefited from access schemes and has worked with low income communities and students throughout her career. 
uh, mostly actually as a secondary uh, school science teacher. Karen is today the head of external affairs at the British Ecological Society, uh, leading the work of the Society on Education, Careers, Public Engagement, as well as um, uh, on a focus on EDI activity across the society. So to date, uh, Karen's um, title for a presentation is uh, taking time to showcase diversity, the challenge for Learn Society in boosting diversity in STEM. Karen, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Natalie. Um, I've been silent for an hour and a half and now I really need to sneeze. So if I mute myself all of a sudden, because I'm desperate to sneeze. Um, but I'll start the presentation as, um, now and then we'll carry on from there. So hopefully, um, I like, can my, is my screen obvious to everyone? Yep, that's working, thanks. Okay, thank you very much. So um, thank you to Natalie and to Jenny. The handy thing about being the third person is that actually a lot of the questions that have been asked and the points that have been raised I'm going to reiterate some of those points, but equally with some of the, uh, the questions that have been asked, I have potentially a few answers or a few opportunities that might address some of those questions, if not all of them. So just in case you don't know who the British Ecological Society is, um, we're a learned society. Um, there's just under 7,000 members now across 121 different countries. Most of them, about 60%, are in the UK. We publish eight journals internationally. And in terms of supporting the academic research community, there are 19 different special interest groups across all areas of ecological sciences. And within our membership, our members serve as our boards, our committees, our working groups, our policy groups, and so on. And they work quite hard in terms of driving the work of the society forward. Um, our strategic plan very much has inclusivity as a core value. But over the last few years, and certainly the time I've been a member of staff at the British Ecological Society, how we've thought about inclusion has changed a lot. And I'll, I'll kind of give a, a tiny history of that, but I'd really like to focus on what we're doing at the moment. So we've got a long history of career progression schemes that primarily assumed that people had already made it into PhD and academic research groups. But over the last few years, we've realized that there's an awful lot underneath there where we need to actually think about the future um, PhD individuals and the future research community. And the thing that we've actually really started to focus on are the particular networks. Now, our, our network system began with LGBTQ+, very much led by the community, supported by the community. We then developed a second one, which was much more around physical and mental health. That's much, much quieter, because actually within the academic community, lots of people have been very afraid to talk about their physical and mental health. So it's something that's very much guarded and protected as a group. And then the final one is our racial and ethnic equality and diversity um, network. Originally, it was called the BAME network. They, didn't, they never liked the word BAME, and I've been spent a very long time working out what the name of the network needed to be. They realized it needed to not label its people. It needed to label what it sought to achieve, which is racial and ethnic equality and diversity. And it's ethnicity today that I really, really want to talk about. Um, so we, I'm going to focus primarily on 16 to 18 year olds and undergraduates because they're a core group that most people don't really like working with secondary school students. And they're also a really nice, handy way of, of articulating how are we really going to bring together the different threads, certainly of today's conversation, but more broadly. So HISA is a brilliant source of open data. And if you look at their student data for UK domiciled students, which is a particular point I want to discuss later on, for undergraduate students, you can see that in 2019, 2020, 
The undergraduate student population comprised just under 70% of students who identified as white, which is actually slightly below the UK population from the 2011 survey of 86%. Slightly more identified as of a black ethnicity. And actually those identifying of an Asian ethnicity, it's over 11% which actually when you take that compared to the UK population as a whole, we tend to find that British Asian individuals are overrepresented in the undergraduate population. Now I know that Black and Asian as definitions are really, really challenging and they really hide some of the significant um, barriers that are faced perhaps by British Bangladeshi and other ethnicities within the UK. But it is interesting because when I actually move to what happens in STEM and particularly in the bit of STEM that I care about, which is all the undergraduate courses that could lead to a research or employment career in the environment sector, this is what happens to the diversity. So when you look at the HESA data, there's 167 different courses that the HESA data measures and they're very very broad when you look at the top ones they're not surprising they're medicine they're law they're all the degrees we think of as common um, <clears throat> common degrees but when you distill down all the ones that I think of are the undergraduate degrees of people I know within our membership I know within the sector the ethnicity comes down to very very small numbers and actually this whole section here that is not blue is, is 8%. So it's massive, sorry, 5%, 5%. It's massively underrepresentative of the broader population. And we have to think about why, because when you look at the top preferred courses of Asian students, for example, they are science courses, they're up from up, up eyes, their eyes. Um, they are courses like dentistry and medicine. So it is not that these individuals are not interested in STEM, but they're not interested in a big section of STEM, which is the environment sector. And that's key. So we've actually been working on this as project because we wanted to know what is it that um, 16 to 18 year olds who are choosing their undergraduate courses really think and what decisions are they making? Now, the other background to this that we were particularly interested in is a report from uh, 2018, it was published, that looks at the workforce. So remembering that the undergraduate population of individuals who are not white is less than 5%, you'd hope that if all things were being equal, when you looked at the employment sector, that there'd be 5% of the employment sector identified as not white, but it drops to 0.6%. So if you look at the policy exchange, they ranked 202 job titles, roles and sectors. Job titles include things like taxi driver, dentist, roles include medical health allied professionals, sectors, the environment sector. So within the UK workforce, 12.1% identifies an, an ethnicity which is not a white ethnicity. But in the environment sector, we are the second least diverse sector. The least diverse sector is farming, which is not that far from the environment if you were really trying to think about where you would put it. So we have a massive problem. Now, the other reason why I want to talk about ethnicity is that actually the Chartered Institute for Ecology and Environmental Management, that's Syene in this little box, they've actually just completed a survey. They've been doing a lot, quite a lot of work and there's a lot of work going on in the environment sector as a whole at the moment, particularly around ethnicity. But they surveyed their members to look across a range of diversity data. It's a really good report and worth having a read of. But actually 13% of their respondents did say during their education, they were in receipt of free school meals. Now, assuming that everyone employed by and within the environment sector was a student five years ago, that, 
that actually did match relatively well to the to the preschool meal proportion five six years ago high enough 18 percent but allowing for the fact that people have had to do their degrees and move into the employment sector so it's not necessarily a matter of income alone because once people get into the education routes they're seemingly looking well represented within the employment routes in terms of their income which hopefully means that a lot of those low income programs are working but they're obviously really not working when we think about ethnicity so that gives us with two really important questions so the first is how do we increase the diversity of future undergraduate populations and the future of the environment sector as a whole but acknowledging that there's very few individuals within that sector at the moment who do represent a measure of diversity and one thing that I will talk about is, is the importance of role models. If we acknowledge that role models really, really do matter, and they do, how do we actually increase that diversity without overburdening that relatively small number of people who are busy trying to push their own careers forward? And there's real evidence that people from underrepresented communities investing in helping their wider community progress within their sector have a career penalty in terms of their research careers and moving forward and that that can't be a fair way of treating those individuals so the way that we do it as a learning society um, i joined the society 2006 so i've been there quite a long time um, and at the time i was the first and only education staff member in the society and we had very little in terms of supporting diversity, it's very much focused around people who are already in their PhD research career pathways. There were programs that were there to support women and women in ecology, but there was very little else. And it took us quite a long time to move the programs forward into thinking about, well, if there's not enough PhD students coming through, how do we support the current undergraduate population? And we came up with an undergraduate summer school, which was all about inspiring. It was a brilliant program, is a brilliant program. It's happening next week. And then obviously as the research culture changed and pathways to impact came in for universities, the opportunity to support our membership in public engagement work grew quite significantly. And I'll talk a little bit more about that briefly. But then we started to notice that when we, we looked at everything that we were doing, we looked at how we supported gender, we supported socioeconomic status, you could be really diverse, providing you were white. And that's where we made the distinctive shift to say that we have to actively tackle and actively acknowledge that the environment sector as a whole is extremely undiverse and there's something that we need to do about it. So, in terms of public engagement, which is the first bit I'll talk about briefly. So at the moment, the Edinburgh Science Festival is happening. It's happening online. Um, to follow on from a question that Jenny was asked about digital poverty and moving activities online, we actually spoke to a group of students in, in 2018 before the digital focus of COVID happened and they were tired of organisations like the BES thinking a bit of online content was good enough. They were already exhausted of screen time. They wanted to be outside. They wanted to be doing real science, doing real practical work, talking to real people. That was January 2018 and the world has been really different. I, I personally think there's a need to go back and engage people with science in a physical sense because that, does, that actually does help with digital poverty. It is more expensive. Kids were already tired of online content before COVID hit. Um, anyway, separate point entirely. Our public engagement program is really about families, parents, adults. Parents are important here. Um, 
we don't so much do public engagement as an organisation. What we, what we actually do is work with our member community, the academic community, to facilitate their public engagement. And do that with, through training and offering training opportunities, through co-designed training opportunities, but also because as a learning society, we can actually bring together different members from different institutions, but with a shared passion for a particular topic. So in the beginning, we went to RHS Chelsea. Um, it's really big and nobody needs telling what RHS Chelsea is. Interesting impact actually from a science policy and a trust in science. It's quite a good place to go because you have a conversation with somebody about the role of green manuring, the need to think differently about how we manage our landscapes, and then said person wants to ask the county. You're in a position then to engage with people who are actually on the ground and are able to make real changes. But Chelsea is a bit of a microcosm and it's not a particularly diverse place to attend. There's a certain income level, there's a certain ethnicity, it's an interesting level in the British class system, to be honest. Um, so after a while, we thought, well, that's really useful. It's interesting. These individuals often are already half interested in science. They maybe don't just think about science. Gardeners know what gardening is. They understand a lot of relationships. They just wouldn't define themselves as ecologists. But we want to reach a more diverse audience. So we go to places like your Eureka Science Museum and Smashfest, which actively focuses on diversity, focuses on hard to reach communities. It focuses on providing free events for families and children. And that allows us to engage with a different group of people. But the interesting thing is, to go back to my first point, is that we don't do public engagement as much as we help our members do public engagement. And one of the big barriers that we found and one of the bigger challenges that we found is that very early on, we put out an open call for our members, come and get involved, help co-design our exhibit at Chelsea, come along and deliver some public engagement work. Loads of people stood up for that particular opportunity. Loads of people were actively involved. When we asked to do that one year in Lambeth for a Lambeth Science Festival, we only had two people step forward, both of them were white, um, both of them were women, but there was much, much less uptake of those opportunities. And what we've actually noticed is that open recruitment is not inclusive. We put out open calls, then we get the same faces, which is they're not bad faces, they're lovely faces, but we're getting the same faces off offering their time and their willingness to engage. And actually, when time is short and you've only got a short period of time to recruit those individuals, then it's really not inclusive. So that active approach of deciding that we want to run an event next year, we want to have a diverse team and diverse panels, we're going to actively go out and have to reach those people, talk to them and involve them. And because you don't want to say, I want a diverse panel, you are a person of colour, it wants to be something that's much, much more clearly articulated around the science, taking time to build the trust and build those direct invitations have really, really mattered. And I'd say that of everything that I've done, really building the trust with the membership, the academics to work with those individuals have been critical. Um, I'm not going to talk much more around public engagement. But the reason that we continue to do it is because it allows us to reach parents and that's actually the next bit. So it might not look like it. Um, the other big thing that we work on, and this was my pet project. Um, so we work on a summer school. Um, it's targeting 16 to 18 year olds. Specifically, not saying A-level, it recognises that students actually might be Scottish and therefore not taking A-levels, but equally, they might be taking BTECs and they might be taking different courses. 
But what we wanted to do was to take a group of students who were just before their UCAS applications and support them to see what opportunities could be if they were to pursue, to pursue a career in STEM and specifically in our case, in the environment sector. Now, in order to participate in the summer school, completely free to attend, they had to be from an underrepresented minority, they had to be from a lower socioeconomic group, or they had to be the first generation in their family to consider higher education. What we actually worked out over the course of four years is that we need four different things. We need to inspire the next generation. Now, actually, I was at a conference all last week called Young Nature, which was all about inspiring the next generation. It's really interesting. Lots of going out into the field, getting some binoculars and learning to identify things. Um, lots of opportunities to go to zoos and to homeschool and to build dens in the woodland and to just learn and be inspired. And the environment sector is brilliant for that because we have an amazing discipline within which we can inspire people. Except that nearly everybody in that conference last week was white and nearly everyone in that conference last week assumed that everyone could afford to go and buy a pair of binoculars. Last time I checked, they were quite expensive. Even I am a bit hesitant about buying binoculars. Um, and what we didn't discuss were three key things that we've seen through our 16 to 18 summer school. They have to feel safe and they don't. They have to feel confident and they don't. And they have to feel purposeful and they don't. So no matter how inspired we want to be, and that's the fun bit, that's the cool bit, that's the whole the cuddly animal, no matter how much fun we have doing that, three key things for me that these students are missing and that I fully accept other people may have different opinions. So this is very much my opinion based on my experience of the summer school. So, um, you can't type into a chat box. One of the things that we do in our summer school is at the very beginning of the week, we give some context. And I want you to think about this right now in your own heads. If I asked you, what are your global challenges? In your mind, what are they? What comes to your mind as somebody involved in science communication? Because the question for me is, if, if STEM, if ecology, if the natural environment, if our place in the natural world is key to resolving our global challenges, what are our global challenges? And if you take a moment to think about that, do you think that it's about increasing global conflict? Because that's the first thing our students said. Do you think it's about an overpopulated world? Do you think it's about economic inequality and economic instability? Because that's the third thing that they said. We asked these students what they thought were the big global challenges. These are the three things that they said. Now, because they were actually bright, they were all students who were definitely going to be getting good A levels. They'd worked out quite quickly that we probably wanted them to say something like, biodiversity losses, and probably climate change, probably want us to say that too. But from a big STEM question point of view, these, these, these green bubbles are not the first things that we think of. And I do wonder sometimes if our lack of success, because we've all been doing this for many years, isn't because we're not inspiring enough. It's because we've actually forgotten to ask, what is it that's actually on their minds? first. It's really difficult to care about biodiversity if you're really worried about getting shot or you're really worried about not having a roof and a house over your head. And actually this was really important. I think the secret to engaging some communities in STEM is actually to engage them in science into policy. Because when I make my summer schools work, if I start talking to people about policy, 
then they get engaged really quickly because then it's about empowering them to take the scientific knowledge and use that to make change for the better. That's what they're fascinated by. And that's understandable because then having had this big conversation, we could talk about, well, actually overpopulation, you ask them the simple answer, they're 17 years old, so they're fairly brutal. Well, you just stop having babies. You don't let people have babies. Well, that's, you know, do you want to be the generation told you're not allowed to have babies? If we want to talk about increasing global conflict, they're not easy to go. Why is that conflict happening? And actually, over the course of the week, you can bring everyone back the same thing I used to say as a teacher, you can teach the whole of biology from an ecological point of view. If biology is just ecology in the bag, really. Although I appreciate that chemists basically say that humans are just chemists, uh, chemicals in a bag. Um, and actually that, that discussion around interconnectedness becomes really key. We asked them another question. So, the question that we asked was this. It was 2018, July, and it was announced that week that London had just been named the world's first city national park. Loads of plans for green spaces. Isn't that a good thing? Peter Uni Krishnan, who was a lecturer at the University of Sheffield, still is a lecturer at the University of Sheffield, spent a lot of her life doing environmental policy based in Calcutta. She's doing a postdoc at Sheffield. We were doing a whole session on how we, how we deliver environmental policy for a sustainable future. The answer that the students gave is this. Now, before I show you the answer, I've, I've given this answer to the people who helped to turn the City National Park proposal into a reality. They'd never heard this before. They're quite surprised by this. No, it's a bad thing. Because what that means is gentrification. There'll be less affordable housing. There'll be less safe spaces. It means that we'll be homeless. That's what it means to them. So how do we now engage somebody with a really important topic? Landscapes, urban green spaces, sustainable cities. How do we engage them with that topic? If fundamentally what they think is that they're about to be made homeless. And that's a conversation that we were able to have because Hita was in the room, because Hita had done her research and worked on the, the, the blue infrastructure of Calcutta, she was able to have those conversations and to talk about why her science really informed better decision making by the policy makers and by the decision makers. But having Hita in the room as a role model was critical. Now, I haven't put her picture up here because obviously I know this is being recorded, but she's based at Sheffield and she's a wonderful, brilliant scientist. So they don't feel safe and they don't feel confident in their science. So this is a stock image of a particular person, but I, I know the real person who made this quote. He actually is an ecologist, he's a zoologist. But his undergraduate experience has shown them that as a black male, as a, as a healthy young black male, if he's in the field, nobody assumes he's there doing field work and science. They assume that he's there doing no good. And the reason I wanted to use these two examples is because the, the city national park, the engaging with those communities and actually having those conversations, we can do something about that. We can change that. We can change what we do. But fundamentally, there's a whole area of science which a community of individuals feel excluded from because there's an assumption that if they're there, they shouldn't be. They're obviously doing something that they shouldn't be doing. And that's something that is a bigger societal issue that we need to tackle. Now, we are tackling it. So we have our racial and ethnic equality and diversity network. If you identify as a person of colour, you're welcome to join. The gatekeeper is highly protective, it's actually me, of them because they're not ready for allies yet. They still need a safe space to talk about the challenges of being scientists in the current sector that they're in 
and to build their confidence in communicating about their science and their challenges about participating in science. But there's obviously a lot of people there because there's 50 people in that network. And that's a group of individuals who are all identifying that racism is an issue within their academic career journey. Okay, so if I move us on, um, what we can do, what we can all of us do in our different societies. So when I said learned society, I actually mean any professional body working with the academic community, the next generation, is actually by providing those spaces and actively acknowledging that people need time to share their experiences. They need the peer support. I'd love to give everyone in that network a mentor, but there isn't enough people, but they can support each other. And the key thing that they've come up with is that actually role models are key. When we put together our 16 to 18 summer school, I went looking for people who could be role models. Very few of them were British born. Everyone I found was utterly brilliant, but we are really not bringing people through the British education system. And that is something that we need to actively tackle at primary, at secondary, and actually as they move into their undergraduate choices. The final thing I wanted to put in, and because this is recorded, I can't show you the video. Um, back in 2018, when we put together these students to talk about why they were struggling to engage with STEM, they were really, really clear that it's, it's cool to not use plastic, it's cool to be vegan, it's cool to take part in climate strikes, it's cool to want to be part of Extinction Rebellion. But if you want to actually understand plant soil interactions, you're still, and I quote explicitly, you're still freaky weird and you're very much on your own. And that I think is quite critical because the first part is there's a political activism and that is growing within the student population. So that is the underpinning scientific knowledge. Those concepts are still quite challenging to articulate, but they're actually what we mean as an academic community when we think about, well, how are we going to resolve climate change? We, we don't think extinction rebellion, that's political activism. We think we need to better articulate nature-based solutions. Um, and they're still isolated, which is the other unique opportunity that we can offer by coming together. An individual in a, in a school, in a, in a university, in an undergraduate programme, they might be the only person fascinated by plant soil interactions. And then if they're the only girl or the only person of colour or the only person who identifies as non-binary or has a disability, they're even more isolated. So by bringing people together in these networks, we provide that measure of security and safety. The other thing that they articulated really clearly, and again comes back to what A, what's in the curriculum, but also how we empower teachers, is that we need role models. This is what they said. We need real role models, not media and TV personalities, we want real scientists doing real science who can help us feel normal. That's what they said. People they can talk to who help them feel normal. But the key thing comes from Sanya. So Sanya, and this was, there's two points on this. Sanya is British Indian and she had no access to social media. So anyone who knows the BES knows Natalie, knows we're insane for social media. We love social media. It's a great way for the academic community to interact, to connect with each other. We've all got a huge number of stories about why you should join Twitter as an academic for the benefit of your career. But as somebody who's just turned 18, her parents have given her a really clear directive, no Twitter. Twitter's not allowed, Facebook's not allowed. So all of those potential digital access routes are not open to her at all. Now she'd come to the summer school fairly certain that her mum and dad had given her a choice of medicine or law. That was her choice. 
she'd got level eights and nines in her GCSEs in a really high performing school with a really good to Russell Group university transition rate. At the end of the week, I asked her the question, has this week changed what you think you might do at university? Now, she'd actually just done a session with the brilliant Safi Darden from Exeter on sexual reproductive behaviour in stickleback fish. And she loved it, loved the whole thing. But the quote she gave, which has stuck with me all this time, is I want to do more field work and conservation. And now I can talk to my parents because they're a bit iffy about biology. And she says, right, they're a bit iffy about biology and they don't know what I can do with biology. It's just a degree that's going to lie around and do nothing. But now I can say, this is what I want to do. This is what I can do with biology. And this is why it matters. And that, I think, for me, is how we approach this. Sanya was quite confident. She went home and had that conversation. She, she's gone off. She's doing natural sciences. Probably not the best experience because we're all in COVID world now, but that is what's happening. She had a friend and her friend was in tears on the last day. They nearly always in tears because they're exhausted, but she was in tears because she didn't know how to have that conversation with her parents. No. She was utterly convinced she didn't want to do law. She, she'd come with the same perspective. She was doing law. She was utterly convinced she didn't want to do law, but she didn't know how to talk to her parents now. Except that she, she'd met Hita. And Hita went to London and went to the school and met with the students because Hita is Indian and Peter could talk to her about how this works in an Indian mentality, Indian cultural way of thinking to help facilitate that student to have that conversation with her parents. That's what I think what we have to do. It, Sammy was fine. We just send her off, have a chat with her parents. She was fine. A different student needed a different approach entirely, but it needed the cultural understanding of in the context of this particular bit of science, this is how you can be purposeful, you can make a difference and contribute to your community. That's the bit that mattered. And finally, the other thing is, is that I couldn't do that. The way our summer schools work, and, and this is a problem with funders, is that we bring teachers. So when we first developed this project, and I'm conscious I have to finish really quickly, um, we worked on the concept of we want to bring teachers and empower teachers. You can't get funding to do anything with teachers. Get funding to do stuff with kids. You can't get funding to do stuff with teachers. So the BES made the decision that we would fund the project because teachers were key. And that's the other shift. I can work with 30 students a year. Those teachers work with hundreds of students a year, every year. And by empowering teachers, we actually deliver for the, the students and the parents who can have those conversations. I'm going to leave you with one last slide because I know I've got to finish. COVID means that our summer schools didn't run in 2020 and 2021. Our undergraduate one did online as a virtual event. You didn't do that with this particular group of students because we already knew the students we wanted to reach didn't have access to their own device didn't have access to reliable connectivity. So how do we now reach out to those same students when we know that we can't and how do we do that differently? And the final point I'll leave you with is this one here. Child is passionate about bats. They want to work with bats. They think bats are brilliant. If they could move into London Zoo and live in the bat cave, they would. They've had two years of their head teacher telling them that boys do science better. The father recently said that, well, it's up to them. Their career is their choice. So if it was their own choice, and, and as a father, they could make the decision, they'd go into medicine or health because there'll always be jobs and they'll always have money because ecology doesn't pay well. The point is, that's my child. 
my child, whose mum is the head of external affairs for the British Ecological Society, is still hearing these key messages, which is why we have to never, ever stop. But I will stop there. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Karen, for a brilliant talk. Uh, <laughs> sorry, I, I've gone over a lot. I'm really sorry. Oh, it's OK. We still have 10 minutes for questions. Uh, Ayla, is there any question for Karen? Yes, we've got some questions. Um, we've got one here that says, did any students identify their protected characteristics as an issue for being unsafe? For example, ethnicities, gender, disability, LGBTQ+. Yes, they do. So it's quite interesting depending on the students that you're speaking to. So as I said, one of them, just by being a healthy, physically fit, strong, tall, black male, they found that an issue. But actually, um, women in particular said that it was much harder to travel to remote locations to do a lot of the work. The environment relies hugely on, a, on, on voluntary experience and being willing to go out and travel to remote locations. For certain communities, as, as a female to do that is, is considered really quite inappropriate and becomes a barrier. Um, but there's quite a lot of different issues. And one of the things that we're working on is, is facilitating those dialogues, because ultimately what we've noticed and what we've, what we've realised is that there are answers, there are strategies that can be used. It's that actually supervisors, teachers, lecturers, they're quite nervous about having those conversations and therefore they don't. And that lack of open communication is actually the biggest issue. Great, thank you. Um, and there's one that says, um, if you reach children at 16 to 18, is it almost too late as they've already made their decision to go to college or A-levels and they've already picked their subjects? I think no, because I think that you need you need activities at primary, at lower secondary and upper secondary, because I think that we, we tend to think we tend to think that it is too late, but it's never too late, I think is actually the short answer. These, these are students who are maybe going to go and do a degree in biology because they don't know what they can do with biology and therefore actually having a conversation with them when they are cognitively older and therefore able to process why plant soil interaction links to climate change which perhaps a six-year-old or a ten-year-old wouldn't I think is actually the point we, we don't teach the biochemistry of photosynthesis to a year four student we teach carbon dioxide and water go together and magically a plant grows that's what we teach it's it, we should we should take the same approach to public engagement as that we do to teaching more complex interventions as they get older so you can see the connection between that science and that particular opportunity. Thanks Karen and we've got one that says why do academics dislike speaking about their physical or mental health and disabilities? Because there's a real fear it will, in, it will block their career progression that's it there's a real fear that if they talk about it it will cost them their career. And another one, which is the final one we have for now, which is if we get role models or scientists connecting to the communities, is there a preferred way or platform for these role models to be accessible? I don't think so. I think that that's actually, there's lots of different routes. And I, and I think that one of the biggest issues that we have is that because we're all limited on resources, we're trying to find the one simple route. And, that, and to be honest, I think there is no one simple route there's actually the, the, the almost that differentiated approach to it's this particular community with this particular individual. How do we best support them to engage with each other? Thank you. I've got no answers, just <laughs> perspectives. And we've got one comment here from someone who said, uh, your part about what the dad said and the child said is very reflective of um, 2000 Multicultural Girls Comprehensive, where they used to work as HOV, which I guess is head of biology in the 80s. Three weeks of field working up in forest, completely eye opener for students. I think field work really matters. And actually we found with some of our education programs, particularly where we, we might be working with Muslim girls, you almost have to give them a day to go out in the field and just be a bit nuts because they've very rarely had that opportunity. So, where we've seen programs go wrong it's because teachers or individuals have gone out expecting to deliver the perfect learning experience 
first when actually what needed to happen was those students needed to feel safe and confident in that space first. And that's why that extended period, we use a week, not three weeks, but by using a whole week, you overcome those fears because actually the, the magic in our students always happens three days in. They feel safe, they feel confident, and suddenly they've got headspace for that science to morph into future opportunities. Great, thank you. That's it for questions from our chat. Thank you so much, Anna. And thank you very much, Karen and Jenny, for uh, some superb talk today. Um, so we're going to end for uh, this session uh, for today. Please join us tomorrow, where you're going to hear about uh, Subbox Science and Giving a Voice to Women in Science by Syrian Sumner. Also um, from Kerry Bailey talking about what's happening in the London Zoo. So Karen, if your daughter wants to hear about bats, <laughs> might be a good one to join. And then we're also going to hear from Alfredo Carpinetti about uh, being LGBTQ plus in STEM. So that's tomorrow at 10 a.m. Uh, for the two hour window. Thank you very much, everyone, and have a good day. <laughs>